I spent uh, this, uh, an interesting time this uh, last uh, couple of weeks, and I spent uh, the time saturating, I spent a whole week just saturating in chapter 12 again, and trying to walk through this passage. And I've, are we, of course, been dealing with uh, Matthew chapter 12 and this, uh, this whole thing of the unpardonable sin and all of that. We've been walking through all of that. And I'm not sure that my approach hasn't been a negative approach. And I guess the whole subject is kind of negative when you get down to it. And I, do, I don't like that. But I have discovered within the passage through this last week in the saturation, I've discovered a positiveness about the passage that has just, uh, that has just gripped me. Uh, and I've, uh, I, I want to take more a more positive approach to everything that he's saying to us in Matthew chapter 12 because it is a it is a tough scripture uh, we of course have been walking through the uh, grain field scene which goes from verse 12 or verse 1 down through verse 8 in chapter 12 and all of these scenes become really important to what's going on and the reason they're so important is because there's a progressive revelation taking place in each scene and what starts out in a grain field and you say oh, it's a little confrontation a little difference of opinion. Uh, hey, the Pharisees are all bent out of shape about, hey, look, your disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath day. Jesus says it's not that big a deal. I don't know why you're all upset about that. Why is that such an issue to you? And then he moves into all of these discourses, three of them, and uh, just kind of lays it out for them. And it's kind of, a, you look at it and say, well, yeah. And then you move on to the next scene, and as you move to the next scene, you find out the same issue arises. It's not in the grain field, it's in the synagogue. So what's going on in the, out there is going on in here. Why? Because what I am out there is what I am in here. And what I am in here is what I am out there. So how could it be any different? And the issue gets a little deeper as you get into it. And it's a little more revealing because they're in the a mode of accusation and trying to nail him and trying to trap him. And then the whole scene progresses worse. And as you get into this, of course, what's happening is there is this a light revelation and then it gets bigger and and now you're into the conference room which verse 14 and they're actually plotting how they're going to murder him so we've gone from a mere hey, a dif difference of agreement over one thing to a revelation of my heart and another thing to wow I'm in the conference room plotting murder which really reveals who I am. And of course, in a contrast to that, Jesus is revealing who he is. He grabs the multitude on that same Sabbath day and goes out and heals them all. <laughs> and uh, tells them, uh, don't tell anybody about it. Uh, which tells you his motive and we have a revelation of what's going on in him. So all of that is about a progressive exposure of what's going on in one group and what's going on in Jesus. And of course, as I look at that, I, I, I want to be in on the Jesus camp. <laughs> I want what's being exposed in him to be exposed in me. I want, I want all that's going on in him to be what's going on in me. And I, I, I want that to happen. And then you move to the scene that we're really trying to deal with, which is, of course, the blind man, a blind and mute man in verse 22, has been healed, a demon has been cast out of him, and the crowds go wild, and the Pharisees try to offset that whole thing by saying he's in league with Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And of course, we have discovered that Beelzebub is the god of flies and gnats, filth and manure. So it's the lowest, it's the, it's the filthiest, it's the worst thing they could come up with to link Jesus with. And they are saying that what produces Jesus and what flows out of him and what's being exposed in him is uh, the god of uh, the, the Beelzebub god, the ruler of the demons. And Jesus begins in verse 25 and begins to walk through a discourse with them. And that's the discourse we're trying to deal with. Now, as he walks through this discourse, verse 25 down through verse 30, we're calling that the uh, sensibility of logic. In other words, it's a very sensible, logical approach to things. Uh, if you want to sit down to a table and just reason it out, uh, if you want to just set arguments aside and, and, and emotions aside, and you just want to sit down and let's just think it through, he says, here's what it would look like. And he begins to walk them through that. But you see what's going on inside of them. And I've discovered what goes on inside of me is not a logical thing. I thought my wife was just that way. But it looks like I'm that way as well. I mean, it's not just a logical thing. It's not just a, it, it's an emotional thing. And there's all of these feelings wrapped up in this. And there's all of this stubbornness. And there's this 
uh, pride and there's all of this stuff that's inside that just seems to camouflage the logic of it. So if logic would do it, I mean he lays it out, a logic like a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. I mean, come on. So if Beelzebub is casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, good night. Beelzebub is against Beelzebub, which doesn't make any sense. Come on, think that through, guys. Logic would convince you that that can't possibly be true of me. But then it isn't a logical thing, and they don't buy that. And then he moves into this, what we're calling the supposition of truth, which is the climax of the whole deal. And it's, it's really the, the, the pivotal point of the entirety of the passage. Uh, in other words, what happens is you build up to this point, and then he gives this great climactic statement, and then everything from that statement, is, uh, beyond that statement, is going to be an explanation of this truth itself. And what is the truth? Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven against me, will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, through all of this saturation and what we've been talking about, I've come to the conclusion I've really become bolder in it, I guess, than I was, and uh, more forceful in it. And that is the fact that there is no such thing as an unpardonable sin. Wow, and I've been taught that all my life, that there was an unpardonable sin. But I'm proposing to you there is no such thing as an unpardonable sin. Yes! Hallelujah! Isn't that good news? There is no sin that God won't forgive. And he says that. Again, look at verse 31. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Period. Well, there's an exception, manly. Oh, uh, there is. But the blasphemy, not the sin. So he divides sin and blasphemy. So it isn't an unpardonable sin. It's an unpardonable blasphemy. So we got the term wrong in the, in the first place because I was led to believe that there was an unpardonable sin that I was going to do something sometime one day that was going to be so bad that we got to say, I've had it with you. But that's not the case of the passage at all. So there is nothing that God won't forgive. There is nothing you can do that God won't forgive. In fact, let me say it this way. There's nothing you have done or will do that he hasn't already forgiven. <laughs> For forgiveness is in place. Wow. That's such good news. It is totally, absolutely forgiven. Then he makes this one exception. The blasphemy against the Spirit. And of course, we discovered the against is not there. We put that in there. And uh, the idea of blasphemy, of course, is spe uh, speaking stupid things. And if you're going to speak stupid things, obviously it's going to be against something. So there is an against idea contained within the blasphemy idea itself. I understand that. But in this case, it's like the blasphemy against the Spirit. So the blasphemy, I'm speaking stupid things against the Spirit. But I don't believe that's what he's saying. I believe that they, when you go back to the original language, the word against is not there. And it's in the genitive, the Spirit. And I think it's little s. We put that capital S in there. We interpreted verse 32. In, uh, we interpreted verse 31 in light of verse 32. I think we ought to interpret verse 31 uh, in light of verse 31. And then let verse 32 flow. So if the word spirit is not Holy Spirit, but is my spirit, then it's the blasphemy of my spirit. In other words, what's spilling out of me? Why won't God forgive that? Because <laughs> he can. See, deeds of sin can be forgiven. Why? Because there's a payment involved. <gasps> you ripped me off $100. Well, okay, I can forgive you for that. I can. But somebody's got to pay the $100. And if I'm going to forgive you for the $100... I'm going to have to pay for it. So somebody always pays for forgiveness. There's no question about that. Hey, you double up your fist. You sock me in the mouth. Hey, you knock my teeth out. Somebody's, I can forgive you for that. But I got to pay the dentist and I got to have my, wire, my jaw wired. And there's a payment to be made for forgiveness. So every time forgiveness takes place, there has to be a pavement, a payment. No question about that. Well, we understand the payment, don't we? So it's all in place. So the total payment for forgiveness is all in place and done. 
So forgiveness is a done deal. There's no problem. But the blasphemy that comes out of the inner heart, the blasphemy, the speaking stupid stuff that spills out of my nature, that can't be forgiven. Why? Because it's not a forgiving thing. In other words, forgiveness doesn't solve the problem. And I can forgive, Jesus can forgive what's coming out of your insides again and again and again and again, but it doesn't change what's coming out of your insides. Something has to take place in the inner heart of the nature itself that's going to change who you are. Now, we've used the illustration before, but again, hey, my transmission isn't working. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll change the spark plugs. Now, you can change spark plugs all you want to, but it isn't going to fix the transmission. Why? Because it's not, it's a transmission problem. So you can get forgiveness all you want, but that doesn't change the nature. So God, in the wonder of Christ on a cross, not only put in place a payment, the payment for all of my sins, which is awesome, but he also provided a resource to change my nature. Which is what he's talking about in verse 31. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, he says, let me give you an example, an application. Most of the significance of the application, which again is verse 32. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Now, the word against is there, and it's definitely a blasphemy against, speaking against the Holy Spirit. We understand that. In other words, Jesus is standing right in front of these guys saying, hey, here I am. And you can say all you want to against me and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you. In fact, you can nail me to a tree and guess what I'll do? Father, forgive them. There's no problem forgiving you. I will forgive you. Forgive you, forgive you, forgive you. But when you begin to rebel against what is sourcing me, what is coming out of me, what is literally producing my life, which is what? The Holy Spirit. That's not a forgivable thing. Because that's a rebellion that's within your heart. That's a nature that's within you. And I can forgive, but that doesn't change that nature. So this is the application of the principle of verse 31. Do you see that? Well, that makes sense to me. And then he says, let me give you a little parable about this, which is verse 33. It's the story as told. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Now, when you first read that, it looks like he's saying, either make the tree good. So what you need to do is make that tree good. Get with the program, make the tree good. He's not saying that, because you can't make a tree good. And this is an illustration of the nature that you have. So if my nature is bad, if my nature is, is evil, then I, there's no way I can change that. I can slap my hand, bite my lip, change my appearance, put on religious garbs, but that doesn't change my nature. How is the tree, my nature, going to be changed? I can't change the nature. So he's not, in, he's, and by the way, make is an imperative. Either make the tree good. He's not telling you to change the nature of the tree, make the tree good, or make the tree bad. What he's saying is, the tree is good, good fruit. Make them together. Make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. You can't interchange those two. You can't come along and say, good tree, bad fruit. No, make the tree good and its fruit good. Or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. You cannot interchange the two. Well, he's a good guy, but you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, he's really a decent guy, but no, you can't do that. Because either his fruit is bad, his tree is bad, his fruit is bad. You can't intermix. So he says, stop that. Which is interesting because it's such a strong holiness truth that sin 
Oh, we go over this all the time. Sin is not described by the activities of the deed. You do not define sin by the activity of the deed. No deed is evil by its very activity. What makes it evil is what produces it. So anything could be a sin if it was produced by. So the fruit of my tree is going to be determined, good or bad, by the condition of the tree. And he gives this story. Interesting. Then he moves to verse 34 and gives us the speakers are revealed. And I think the last time we uh, dealt with this, we talked about this, but he, he moves right into their faces and says, and this is really negative. Brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? So he just lays it out to them. Says we were in the grain field. We were in the synagogue. You were in the conference room. Now we're over in the theological discussion and what's going on? Everything that's coming out of your mouth is evil. Accusation, plotting murder. It's all evil. You're revealing yourself. By what? By the very fruit, by the very words of your lips. They reveal who you are. So it's impossible. If you can't take a good, good tree and give it bad fruit, and you can't take a bad tree and give it e good fruit, if you can't intermix that thing, then we can't intermix it in your life either. So he says, how can you, being evil, speak good things? And then he comes to this beautiful statement. Oh, what a statement. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things now he starts the statement with four for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks for is the greek word gar and it means this is the reason I've said what I've said. In other words, he's been giving them this long argument that we just walked through and says, what is the basis of the argument? Oh, here's the basis of it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, the subject of that little sentence is the word mouth. And the verb is the word speak. But... In the Greek text, it's just about like it is in the English text. And this is very significant. Mouth and speak, subject and verb, are at the end of the sentence. And they front-loaded the abundance of the heart. For the abundance of the heart. Which, you know, in the Greek language, when they front-load it, that means it's the most important thing. That's what they're really trying to say. That's what they really want you to get out of the sentence. In other words, the mouth isn't a big deal. The speaking isn't a big deal. The big deal is what? Abundance of the heart. That's the big deal. And they front-loaded it. So what he really wants you to focus on, the most important statement is, just like it is in the English, he says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I want to give you three ideas that are all tied together. One, core value. See, the abundance of the heart is the core value of your life. What do you burn for, man? What just makes you mad? What are you willing to fight over? What's worth dying for? What's your core value? What's the most important thing in your life? He uses the word abundance. And it's really interesting that then as, you, as he carries through into verse 35, he begins to use the word treasure. Now, in my passage, uh, in my translation, probably isn't in yours, but if you look at verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart, probably of his heart isn't there for you. And I don't know that it should be. But the, the implication is there. So he begins to set up a parallel. Or he moves from the idea of abundance to the idea of treasure. And he sets these two ideas up, which are beautiful. Almost in the midst of all of this negativity, there's this positive idea. 
Oh, I want you to get it. The word abundance in verse 34, for out of the abundance is the idea of surplus, has the idea of amount. It means there's just lots of it. It's like my mouth. Just lots of it. It's like preaching. Just lots of it. It's just all over the place. There's just this abundance. This, it's, it's, it's just, there's just enough to, you, never, you don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to say, where did I put that? Why? Because it's just everywhere. Everywhere you go and every room you go into, oh, there it is. You go into the kitchen, it's in there. You go into the living room, it's in there. The bedroom, it's all over the place. So you don't have to search to find it. Why? Because it's in abundance. It's in abundance. In fact, you begin to treat it sloppy. You begin to take it for granted. Why? <laughs> There's just so much of it. It's just everywhere. It's kind of like the way my wife loves me. It's just everywhere. Never mind. Ah, wow. Wow. Just all over the place. It just expresses itself everywhere you go. You run into it. There it is again. Wow. Abundance. Surplus. Plenty of it all over the place. Now, the idea of treasure is different because the idea of treasure actually has the idea of precious and it, it really it's tied into the idea of storing it. In other words, you put it in a chest and you save it. And this is my treasure. So you, you don't hide it, but you, you lock it up. You, you store it. You protect it. You guard it. Because this really matters to you. In fact, this is the word that's used in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Remember when the wise guys came and they uh, found the Christ child, followed the star, found the Christ child, and they knelt. And it says, when they had opened their treasures, this is the same word. In other words, they'd been carrying these treasures, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They'd been carrying it around all this time in these boxes, in these chests. And now when they came, they all, oh, they opened them up and they exposed their treasure. That's, that's this whole concept of good treasure, evil treasure. Now, I want you to put those two together. Here's this element in my life that's in the core of my being. It's the core value of my system. It's what I really burn for. It's what I like. It's what I treasure. It's what the most precious to me is. I hide it, but man, it's hard to hide because it's just in abundance. It's all over the place. It's in surplus. In fact, it exposes itself. In fact, there's no way I can hide it. In fact, it's all over my, my, it's all over my being. In fact, it's all over my lips. So every time I speak because it's in abundance now I think if you would talk to Jesus about this passage he would say well I wasn't just talking about the mouth it isn't well you'd be okay if you just sew your lips shut Because this is an abundance, so it shows up in every arena of your life. In other words, it's all over me, so it's on my lips, so naturally it comes out of my speaking. Oh, it's in my tongue, so it flips right off my tongue. Oh, it's in my sex drive, so it gives sexual expression to itself. Oh, it's in my, it's in my attitude, so it's always expressing itself in my attitude. It's in my emotions, so it dictates how I feel. It's in my, it's in my activities, because it's, it's all over my activities. So everything I do in my activities gives expression to whatever this abundance core value, my inside deal is. Because it's in abundance and it's all. Here's the positive note. Do you think, oh, wouldn't this be awesome, if the living reality of the person of Jesus would become my core value? And he would be what I would store and he would come in such a and it would just be he would be all over my life in fact he'd just be on my lips and I'd just in him out all the time and he would be in my emotions and he would just constantly be affecting the core value would be affecting he himself the person 
would affect the core value of my existence, my emotions, my actions, my whole. He would be in such abundance in my life. I wouldn't have to dig him up. I wouldn't have to hang right there. I got to go find Jesus. <laughs> Because in the bedroom, he's there. He's in the living room, he's there. We're at the kitchen, he's there. He's just every aspect of my life. He's just so abundantly present that, man, where aren't you, Jesus? That's what I want. He calls that a good treasure. He calls that a good treasure. I got to have that. I'm tired of a Jesus that I have to dig up. A religion I have to go find. An ever present Jesus infiltrating the existence of my life. Now, this is a confirmed value in the fact that he begins to talk in verse 35 about a good man and a good treasure, an evil man and an evil treasure. He talks about a good tree and an evil tree, a bad tree, in verse 33. A tree is known by its fruit. It's interesting that the word bad fruit, bad tree, bad fruit, the word bad there literally means rotten. And it's a different Greek word when you come down in verse 35 and he talks about an evil. So he's making a transition. Evil where he's talking about moral. And it's interesting that in verse 35, the word good is used three times and the word evil is used three times. So he really pounds it six times. Good, 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 evil, evil, evil. And the word evil there has to do with the morals of your system. In other words, it's what's stored in you. Can you see a guy gathering together all the rotten? You ever see bananas around here? that have just set too long. <laughs> just gather them together. Oh, I love these rotten bananas. <laughs> Ooh, squishy. Ooh, they're, they're all messy. Ooh, I just love to feel it. Ooh, I can hardly wait to eat them. Ooh, and you just store them and hide them and all. Oh. Is that what you do? You gotta hurry. The compelled value. You'll note the emphasis is brings forth bring forth in verse 35 a good man out of the good treasure of hearts brings forth good things and an evil man out of the good uh, out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things brings forth used twice connection with good connection with evil in other words it has to do with what's inside of you core value so whatever is inside of you that's an abundance and it's the treasure of your life guess what that's what just whoops you bring forth Bring forth is an interesting word. It's ek, ek balo. Ek is out of, out of. Balo means to cast forth. But the interesting thing about balo is, and we've studied this before, but everywhere you go in the, I think it's 46 times in the New Testament where the word balo shows up, which is bring forth, it's always impulsive. In other words, it's never thought through. It's never sit down, calculate, one, two, three, prepare yourself. It's never that. It's always just spontaneous. Just kind of happened. Whoops! There it goes again. I didn't mean to. <laughs> wow. Just all over me. Why? Because he says it brings forth. So whatever the core value is, this, this, this nature that's in you, this, this whoever you are at the depth of your life, guess what? It's in abundance, he says. And it's a treasure that you store and you just bring it, oh, and you treasure it. It's just, wow, it's really valuable to you because this is really, really, really significant. And guess what? It just slips out.
Evil? Good. But you understand it isn't just good. That's the positive element. It's the nature of Jesus. See, the positive emphasis is, I want the nature of Jesus in such abundance, treasured, valued, <gasps> gathered in. I want every room full of him, man. I want him in so abundance that he's all over my mouth. And every time I open it, He brings forth. Don't have to calculate. Don't have to think it through. Don't have to evaluate. Don't have to, well, I better write this out before I say it. I don't want to have to count to ten. I just want spontaneous, automatic, whoa. Because he's in abundance. That would take a mighty change. But he's adequate for that. Well, why doesn't he just forgive me? He has. But this is what he wants to do at the core of your life. Jesus, <laughs> you were that way. If I need any kind of example of how this operates, all I need to do is look at you. Because the Father was your core value. You were really into Him, weren't you? Filled with Him. You said the Son can do nothing of Himself. Wow. Because you were just all wrapped up in the Father. And the Father was in abundance all over you. In fact, it was so strong that we looked at you and said, Whoa, I think I see the image of the invisible God. Oh, Jesus. Could I have you in my life like that? Could I have you in my life like that? Whoops. Jesus, you just spilled out again. You are in abundance. No walls. Hey, Jesus. No walls. No barriers. No blockades. Not hiding. Anything you want to do. Any way you want to do it. Get in the bulldozer of your presence and just mow me down. Work through my life. Whatever you need to take out. Whenever you need to put in. Bring it on. That out of me. The abundance of your presence. The treasure of of the heart would be you. And the total expression of life itself. And I understand that wouldn't mean I'd never make a mistake. I understand that. But even my mistakes would be an expression of you. Wouldn't that be something? Would you work on me tonight? Heads are bowed. You open to this? Well, I've been doing things I have shouldn't have done and I I need to be forgiven. Fine, fine. Fine forgiveness, no problem. Forgiveness is everywhere. Forgiveness, it's an automatic. You're forgiven. But would you, would you go deeper? Would you let Him draw you in until He is your core value? You burn for 
the one driving thing of your life. The passion. And what's in abundance in you is Him. Strip me down, Jesus. Remove everything from me except Yourself. Moments of seeking. Altars open. We're open to You, Jesus. Do Your work.